Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Midwestern Marks podcast. It's been a minute. We've been busy with life. I'm here with the man, the myth, the legend, uh, my friend, brother, mentor, um, and co-editor, partner in crime, the man who could have been a gusano, but instead chose, chose to fight for socialism, uh, Carlos Garrido. Um, how you doing, Carlos? I'm doing very good. I just finished a very stressful semester, so I'm happy to to have some time off to get back to the podcast, um, to hopefully do some theory videos here and there for the YouTube channel and to write more for Midwestern Marks and to keep our, our project going um, and continue to have one of the biggest projects in the U.S. and furthering the class struggle. You bet. Yeah, we both both had a real busy period in our lives here. I've had wrestling season finishing up. Um, uh, combined with our duties with the website there while Carlos has been fish, uh, finishing up school. Uh, but now we're looking to spend some more time doing the podcast and stuff um, and, and covering some contemporary issues, which is part of what we're going to get into today. Um, we wanted to talk about obviously what's going on with Israel and Palestine. Um, we also wanted to talk about Andrew Yang and the blowback that he got um, for his comments um, about about Israel and Palestine that I've been covering on TikTok um, and that a lot of people have been paying attention to. Those videos have been doing pretty well. Um, so it's obviously something people care about. So we want to talk about that. Um, and then we figured that would leap off into a good discussion about Andrew Yang's UBI um, and, and his policy and his candidacy overall. Um, yeah, we just also want to let people know our print journal is coming out um, either at the end of this month or beginning of next month real soon here. Um, we've got it basically completed, and now all that's left to do is print and ship. So, yep, be be on the lookout for that. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a strenuous process, uh, more difficult than what we imagined, but now we got the hang of it. So um, it should be a lot quicker, and it should be a good learning experience for the Midwestern Marks Publishing Press, uh, which will begin to be active as of this year, later this year. So. Um, we're very excited about those developments and excited to get those print journals in your hands. We worked really hard on it. Our graphic designers worked really hard. Um, so we're excited to have you engage with it. Yup, a lot of mental and physical labor, but it's been worth it. It's going to be cool. Um, so yeah, should we talk about what's going on um, over in the Middle East first right now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the first time in a while that something's been in the mainstream news cycle. People have been paying attention to something that I feel like is worthwhile, um, worth putting our attention towards. Uh, so for people who who don't know, or maybe just a little review for everyone and um, the neighborhood, uh, Sheikh Jara, I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering that name, um, but it's the neighborhood where a lot of Palestinians live, where this process of eviction has been carried out. Um, and there were some some violent police crackdowns that happened in that neighborhood. Uh, that blew up and, and things have escalated to the point where you have um, mass Palestinian protests and then you have crackdowns by the Israeli police and, and then now you've seen um, more evictions and the IDF launching missiles that have been leveling homes. Um, there was a video of, of a security guard evicting a bunch of Palestinian people from their homes before the home was blown up by a rocket. Um, and, and the argument, and, and that was posted by uh, supporters of the Israeli state who were saying, look, you know, we're asking people to leave before we blow up their homes. This is justified. You know, it's to the point where they're, they're literally arguing that it's moral to blow up these people's homes as long as they ask them to leave first. So this is part of the continued process of, of settler colonialism um, carried out by the Israeli state, which has been funded by the U.S., um, it's increased at multiple periods, um, at, at multiple points. I believe it actually started um, around the 60s, but um, to the point now where the US is giving Israel $3.8 billion a year um, in funding for their military. So this is, you know, this is something the United States has a, has a direct hand in. Um, obviously Israel served, served as a, a place to, train our troops um, and, and as a sort of a foothold in the Middle East during during imperialist action over there, like the war in Iraq. Um, so yeah, and then you also have the, the one other aspect is um, people like Mike Pompeo claim to be very, very uh, staunch Christians. And, and in the Bible, it says something like, you always need to stand with Israel no matter what. 
Um, so that's that's his excuse. I mean, that's why a lot of the American populace supports it. A lot of evangelical Christians. Maybe I'm more aware of that just because that's um, I was raised around a lot of evangelical Christians. But that's what like Mike Pompeo and the neocons use as their excuse um, for supporting Israel is, oh, the Bible says we have to or one of them. You know, there are a lot. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the other things is that it's not just evictions. Well, the first thing is that they're painting this as a conflict. It's not a conflict. It's it's been a, a a process of occupying that has taken more than half a century. Um, and another thing, it's not just evicting people from their home. In some cases, like random people just show up and start living in half of your house. I was listening to um, this Amy Goodman interview a couple of days ago, and this young Palestinian, I think he was 22 years old. Um, I forgot his name, but he was talking about how this random dude just came nine years ago and just started living in his house. He had gotten home from school and this guy was just there living in his house. Um, and they've gotten into repeated fights. There's audios of, of them fighting, his sister fighting with a guy. And he's like, well, if I'm not here, someone else will be. Um, and uh, a lot of the, one of the things that I haven't seen mentioned is that uh, U.S. corporations do this specifically. Um, they'll set up. They'll have a, a. They'll set up things over there, and then they'll just tell their employees that they can just take any house. Basically, uh, this uh, guy was an employee of an American company in Chicago, um, and that was the case. He just showed up at these random people's house and took it. Um, so, contextualizing it to the history of the U.S., one of the big things that um, through fire, uh, through wood on, on the fire that, that ended up leading to the Revolutionary War of 1776 was the Quartering Act of 1765, um, which uh, said that any of the British colonies had to allow British soldiers to, to get housing from any of the, the colony uh, folks. So um, we're, we're literally talking about the same sort of activity that led to the Revolutionary War. Um, that, that we reacted to with a literal revolution against. Um, but it's somehow okay when it happens in, in Palestine. Um, and like you said, uh, there's a lot of manipulation of, of Bible verses and stuff like that. And uh, I, I think one of the clearest things is that um, there's a lot of Jewish folks that are against this, that recognize that this is against the principles of the religion. Um, so it, 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 inter it I don't know a religion that would accept the actions that have been taking place for over half a century um, in, in Palestine. Yeah, and for people looking, you know, what do we mean? What do we mean by this is not an occupation? I mean, this is not a conflict, right? The way that the U.S. media portrays it, because that's what the U.S. media said, and that's what Anthony Blinken, Biden's Secretary of State, said. Actually, he said both sides need to de-escalate, but Israel has the right to defend themselves, right? So. Um, Israel, who's getting $3.8 billion a year in funding from the, from the U.S. military and, and can buy weapons from the U.S. military industrial complex, and 75% um, of Palestinian people are refugees. 75% of their people now are refugees. Um, so to act like this is a conflict, you know, and not, not an occupation and a forcing of these people off their land violently, um, funded by the greatest military power, um, in the history of the world in the U.S. empire. I mean, yeah, it's not an equal conflict and, and to act like it is, um, is insanity, but, but that's what the corporate media does, you know, essentially gaslight people. But, you know, and, and they've done that for years and they've smeared every single person who, who raises concerns about Israel's actions as an anti-Semite, right? We saw that with uh, Jeremy Corbyn and it, it happened to me, you know, a lot of people were accusing me of being anti-Semitic for, for citing Max Blumenthal. Um, who's a Jewish journalist uh, who was reporting on Israel's crimes. Um, people were saying, oh, the, fa the very fact that I used his journalism uh, made me anti-Semitic and he's anti-Semitic for his comments on Israel. But now with, with these events recently, you're seeing like, uh, you know, essentially like a dance party in this neighborhood um, where they've just pushed all these people out of their homes. Uh, I don't know if you know a video I'm referring to, or it might have been even after they um, they burned a mosque or something like that. Um, I need to, you know, I don't want to 
I don't want to say what it is and be wrong. Like, I got to go look at that video. But they're essentially having like a dance party and waving Israel's flag. And people are like, this is fascism, right? Like, this is an ethno state. And then that on top of Human Rights Watch, um, the, the organization which has CIA members on their board, who almost always side with what the US State Department wants them to say, um, because of mass pressure from activists, um, finally went ahead and uh, went ahead and labeled what Israel's doing as apartheid. So now people are kind of kind of able to see through the 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 lies, I feel like the the lies to justify imperialism and people are really like realizing, oh, no, this isn't an I mean, this isn't a conflict. This is an occupation. Um, and this is uh, this is apartheid. Um, yeah, I think it's important when when you speak of something as a conflict, it involves more than one side doing the same sort of attacking to the other. Um, and what we see in, in, in when it's described as a conflict is precisely the logic of capitalism, which is positivist, which sees things and separates it from its factors, right? I mean, think of like Benjamin Shapiro's facts don't care about your feelings, but you don't understand facts unless you understand them in the whole series of contextual and historical factors that allowed it to be, right? You do a disservice to the fact if you don't understand it in that. So if you see that rockets are launched from Palestine to Israel and from Israel to Palestine, and you see, oh, it's a conflict, it's a both sides. Uh, it's something that's happening with both sides. That's a very shallow interpretation because you fail to realize the factors that surround that quote unquote conflict that they're calling a conflict. Um, and in failing to see that, you see that anything that comes out of the Palestinian side is really a reaction um, to something that was already established from the Israeli side that is both historical and contextual. And as a reaction, it's never the reaction that they willed themselves to do. It's always the reaction that was afforded to them. There's this video of Fidel and a guerrilla, and they ask him about violence. They're like, well, why, why did the Revolutionary War in Cuba have to be violent? And he's like, we didn't choose it to be violent. We took the route that was offered to us, and that's the way resistance works. It's usually the route that uh, the person you're resisting against affords you to take in order to undermine the authority that they're uh, uh, Su suppressing you under so it's it once you and again like i i don't want to get too theoretical but it is these problems of observing it as a uh, observe somewhere in between a conflict and an occupation go back to the problem of how we observe the world whether we observe the world and what marx and engels would have called the the bourgeois mentality of, of metaphysics, what the 20th century Marxist theories will call the positivist logic, or whether we observe the world as dialectical. If we observe the world as conditioned historically and as each moment playing a part in a bigger series of other moments. Um, and when we do that, we see that this has been a historical occupation of Palestine, not just new events that are surfacing now in the media, not just a two, uh, a, a, a two party conflict, but it's an occupation of one party by another and that other party is just merely reacting to defend uh, their sovereignty, something that again this nation was based on. So, yeah, just look at the just look at the CNN reports right now, where they're saying a conflict, both sides, but Israel, coincidentally, the side who the U.S. is funding has the right to defend themselves. That's how CNN tells the story. And then go watch Abby Martin's Gaza Fights for Freedom. You know, Abby Martin, an independent journalist who's um, well versed in Marxism. Look how she tells the story. She starts from the early the early 1900s, right? Or she even goes back farther than that. She talks about the ancient history of these civilizations, and she talks about how through the last 120 years things have changed. And of course, you can look at that famous map of of Palestine's land starting in like 1940s to now. And at various points in time, the amount of land that they actually control has shrunk further and further and further. Um, and that's how you're able to see, you know, history moves dialectically. Things, things don't happen in a vacuum, right? You hear on CNN, Israel-Palestine conflict, all right? So the average American who, let's be honest, doesn't really know anything about the Middle East hears that and goes, oh, a conflict between two countries. It sounds like Palestine and Israel are at war. Okay. But then once you look at the historical context of that, you're talking about a country who's had their, the amount of their sovereignty shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and a people who have seen 75% of their own communities become refugees. Um, so when you look at it from that historical context and look at the increase in funding from the US military every year, and then 
you add the context of the U.S. has had, you know, most of our imperialist action, at least in this century, has been in the Middle East, um, where Israel is, you know, attacking countries like Iraq, Syria, and Libya. Well, uh, Syria and Libya are in Northern Africa there, but still, you know, close, uh, same region. Um, you can understand why the U.S. wants to be such good allies with Israel um, so that they can that have that region as a geopolitical and, and economic foothold. So I guess then we can transition to what Andrew Yang said, um, which, which we've been covering lately, or I've been covering on the TikTok at least. Um, he tweeted out his support for Israel, and there was actually a lot of blowback. Um, people were, were very upset. Uh, his justification was that I mean, there he made a lot of justifications, right? But the one that stuck out to me as like a Marxist listening to people like Kyle Kalinske and Crystal Ball and, and sort of the progressives um, uh, attack Andrew Yang about this is, is they kind of accepted this idea where he was like, oh, but there are economic and financial ties between New York and Israel. And they were like, okay. And actually Crystal Ball pushed back. She's like, I think that's exaggerated, right? I don't think, you know, much capital, you know, there's much connection there. And it's like, that's not what you should be pressing him on. You should be like, what? You're saying you're supporting apartheid? You're supporting an ethno state because it's better for the economy? And I understand, you know, as someone uh, running for local office, as a mayor, you want to take care of the economy of that area. But say you're going to start a jobs program then, right? Say you're going to do some other plans to get to get more investment in that region that's going to start jobs. Don't literally say, no, I need to support an ethno state because that's what the capitalists in my region want me to do. I mean, but but he says something like that and, and people, uh, the, the capitalist realism is so, so real. I don't know. I don't even, I, I kind of <laughs> tripped over my words there, but people are so brainwashed, you know, to, to where they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, uh, we need to support an ethno state to make sure that uh, we make enough money, um, which is insane. Yeah, well, it's important to understand that Israel and American imperialism are tied together um, and that American imperialism is the extension, the, the modern extension of, of, of capitalism, right? Uh, imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism, neo-imperialism. Uh, so it, again, when we, the reason why the theoretical matters is that it helps you explain why these failures in interpretation from these different leftist uh, uh, figures come about. and. I think there is a connection between Yang's view on Israel and Yang's uh, solution to the problem of inequality as being UBI. And they both stem from the inability to look at the microcosm, that which is at the essence of society, as the productive sphere. Um, you look at the problem in Israel as a mere problem of either religion or a mere political problem. And I'm not saying it's not, those factors are not included. But if you fail to look at it as a as a question of land grabbing, as a question of um, expropriation, if you fail to see it in its economic light, um, again, you're not going to see it in its full context. Um, and, and I think, like you said, this is this is something that's tied um, to bourgeois thought. Uh, what's at the essence of, of bourgeois thought? It's the unquestionability of how the relations of production take place. Um, so when Andrew Yang says that what's going to solve uh, the problem of inequality or, or the problems we're going to face with automation is giving everyone a thousand bucks, um, that's a solution that deals with the realm of distribution. That's a solution that doesn't fundamentally change what led to that problem of inequality in the first place. Um, and we can see parallels here with, with the question of Israel. If you talk about de-escalation or if you talk like to talk about de-escalation from both sides or something like that would require you to fundamentally not understand the part that one has played in expropriating the lands of the other um, and killing its people and in doing all of these violence acts that go together with the process of expropriation. So um, I think to, to tie it back to like the, the theoretical, which is also practical, it's important to understand how this logic hits every sphere uh, and, and that it, like you said, it's prevalent in the left. We don't look at the moment of production. Um, that the biggest boogeyman there is in the left is reductivism. And reductivism is not just reductivism of, of class that people are scared of, but reductivism of productivist uh, forms of thinking, of trying to tie everything back to production. But I think that's what the Marxist approach is. It, it's, it's, you have to look at 
all the other events interconnected with that moment of production that is at the heart of it. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you want to go deeper into the the problem of, of UBI or, or stay more into this uh, Israel Palestine situation yeah. or what? Yeah, I think I mean I think we can cross over there um, or jump over. I think if you're if you're listening to this right now and you're interested in politics, right? You care about politics. You look at what's going on um, with Israel and Palestine, and that you know bugs you. Um, the next step is to understand things theoretically, I guess. Like when I'm covering this on TikTok, the one the videos I have explaining theoretically what's going on have much less views than the ones where I'm just letting people know what's going on and making the moral argument of this is bad because children are being killed and people are being evicted from their homes, right? But if you really care about this stuff and you really want to have an understanding, um, the Marxist method and the reason we call ourselves Marxists in a country where that's experienced years of red scare propaganda where people think you're insane is because it has an explanatory power um, Marxist theory does of the things that go on around you this is what we're talking about when we say don't look at things in a vacuum the connection between American capital and American imperialism and their connection then to, to Israel and and countries like Saudi Arabia too um, understanding how all these things are connected um, and having a theoretical understanding becomes very very important and and like you're saying um, most bourgeois economics, as they're called, or what you'll see in, in corporate media, um, deals with the realm of distribution, as we said. But what Marx does, it's something like in the going into chapter six or seven of Capital, he's like, now we need to go where no bourgeois economist has gone into the realm of production. And that's the difference, you know, in Marxism. It's, it's about how, how things are produced. Um, and this is what imperialism tries to do is seek more land and more natural resources and drive down the price of labor so that more can be produced, more surplus value can be made for the capitalist. Um, and once you understand that, you can start to understand things, right? Like, oh, Andrew Yang wants the capitalists in New York to make more money because uh, their capital might be tied um, tied over here in the Middle East. And that's why he's supporting, that leads him to supporting an ethno state, right? Having the theoretical understanding behind it besides just the, the sort of moral outrage. And when it comes to someone like Andrew Yang, I've noticed a lot of my followers on TikTok who are like we're saying, maybe people who haven't yet taken the leap to, to taking a theoretical understanding of politics or just kind of, you know, who are just being in it uh, for moral reasons or whatever else, which is great, you know, we're glad you're here. But um, <laughs> there, uh, Andrew Yang's UBI, as you're saying, is also a theoretical failure, right? Um, because UBI fails to understand um, that at the core that imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism and these imperialist actions can't be changed unless you change as we're saying, the relations of production, right? You have a system in which a small minority of society don't hold all the, the means of production, the wealth and the power and exploit labor, and then try and expand their territory overseas. You need to change that relation at the core of the system if you want to change the, the negative things you're seeing uh, externalize themselves in the system. And this is what Andrew Yang fails to understand because his, he's, a, he's a former capitalist whose solution is essentially, we'll dump more money into the economy, right? People's jobs are being automated away. People have a ton of debt. Um, people are just poor and struggling, working people. So we'll just give them a bunch of money, what Marx would call the a un, universal equivalent, this thing you can trade for all other things. Um, so I'll let you talk about that more. But yeah, I just wanted to talk about the importance of a theoretical understanding and why Andrew Yang not having a theoretical understanding continually is leading him into doing things like supporting imperialism, um, not having a good enough solution for, for changing the plight of workers, uh, all these things. Yeah, and like you mentioned, I think a lot of people are coming at it through a normative approach, which is fine. Uh, like Daniel Delon used to say, um, the normative is the sails of the ship, the, the actual ship itself is a scientific understanding, right? To move people, you need that element of, of, uh, of morality, um, but it's not enough. As Engel says, um, what ends up happening is that the people that are more uh, focused on morality end up placing themselves farther and farther from understanding what is, the, what is at the core of this uh, effect that we're looking at and that we're repulsed by morally. Right. Um, so a, a theoretical understanding is essential. When Marx is looking at capitalism, he's doing it fundamentally different than from from than than the 
the theorists that came before him. And even though the theorists that came before him are heavily influential and some of them are, make up great bases of, of his analysis, um, they were not looking at the system holistically. Marx is. Marx sees that there's various moments in production that it's not just one and, and, and the other, that it's a whole process that's, um, that, that has four fundamental moments, uh, production, distribution, exchange, and consumption. And what we see is that the capitalists, um, the bourgeois theorists, they, they'll recognize the effects in the realm of distribution uh, as unjust or um, uh, non-moral or whatever, and they'll propose tweakings in those realms, in those different moments. Um, what, what we see when that happens is that, well, what, what is the moment that they never touch? What's the moment they'll never talk about? It's that moment that precedes all of the other ones. That's the moment of production, how things are produced, what are the relationships in, in taking place and how things are produced. And that's important uh, for a few reasons. Um, well, before that, there's, there's a part in the Grandrees where Marx is thinking of how is it that these moments relate to one another? And he explains, well, to some extent, production is determined by consumption and it is determined by distribution, by exchange but it is ideally determined by those. In order to produce, you make a plan of, well, who's gonna consume it? Uh, how are we gonna distribute all of that, right? But in order to consume something, you need to have it first produced. You need the thing, right? So it's materially determining of the other moments. So there's a fundamental difference here. And what we'll see from bourgeois economists uh, and, and from people on, on the left that will call themselves socialists, but that don't have the Marxist method is that they're fine with tweaking the realm of distribution, having the government hand out money, um, doing you know e even some things that we should support, right? Uh, uh, but what would not fundamentally ever be talked about and what would not fundamentally change as long as we stay within these confines is how things are produced. Um, and that's, what, that's something that we have to talk about constantly because it is only by talking about that can we change from treating the unequal effects that result in the other realms uh, in those realms and, and treat them at the source? One of the good examples that was given to me by um, a professor that, that we both had and we both admire very much that we have on board as a writer, Dr. Dar, was that if you have a, if you're at a, a, a little lake or something and you see a kid drowning and you go rescue him and then you see another kid drowning and you go rescue him, at some point you have to go upstream and see what's going on. And if you see a dude just tossing babies <laughs> down the river, uh, that's the root of the cause, right? It'd be pretty foolish to go back to the lake and to just wait for the kids to get there and, and, and deal with them there. You know, you go to the root, you solve the problem, you fix it at the root, and that's how you're able to prevent that problem from happening. What happens when you have people um, like the Keynesian school, like Yang, um, like, uh, some of the people in the capabilities approach, like uh, Representative uh, Ro Khanna and then stuff like that, um, that deal with the realm of distribution, they see the problem there, but they want to stay within there is precisely that approach. Let's make it more efficient to rescue the kid from the lake instead of going upstream, looking at the problem at the root and fixing it there. Um, so it's important for us that we deal with practice and, and theory to yes, acknowledge that sometimes uh, an immediate or short-term advantage is, is presented by dealing with something as that band-aid approach of dealing with it at the lake. But we also have to maintain our principles and our long-term focus as going uphill and, and eliminating the problem at the root. Um, and that's the difference from the socialists who, like you said, the crystal balls and the Kalkalinskis and, and all of those social Democrats who engage with things in that realm from, from Marxists, which is what we're trying to promote in this, uh, in, in this project of ours. Yeah, and the, all the contradictions that we see, all the negative things we consider to be negative about capitalism are things that the, they begin at production and then they externalize themselves. So this is essentially the argument of Marxist capital. So I don't have to give a million examples here, but um, Andrew Yang's UBI, for example, right? All he's going to do is, is give everyone a thousand bucks a month. Okay, so this policy goes in into, um, into action. Everyone starts getting a thousand dollars a month. If I'm the landlord, then I'm going to think, hmm, 
my tenants are all getting a thousand dollars a month now. I think I'm going to jack up the price of rent, right? Or, or your boss is going to think, oh, I don't have to pay him as much now. He's getting a thousand dollars a buck, a thousand dollars a month from the government. I'll lower his wage. The capitalist is then going to react to whatever you've done to try and fix the system because you never, you never fix the perverse relation that's there in the first place, right? Why is someone allowed to charge you a big portion of your paycheck just because they own the land that your house was built on or your house, right? Um, why, why do we have these things in the first place? And these happen at the moment of production, right? Where you have a worker um, who's, who's creating surplus value, which is then stolen from him by a capitalist. Same thing with, you know, and that's why UBI doesn't do anything about things like imperialism, right? Imperialism stems from the moment of production. You have uh, production being, or production for the profit of a capitalist being carried out by the worker. The worker is the one doing the production. So if the capitalist then sees an opportunity to expand the amount of territory and the amount of capital he owns and go overseas, he's going to then do that. Um, and that, you know, whereas the worker doesn't really have incentive to do that, he just wants to go to work and make enough to put food on the table for his family. So these contradictions that begin, you know, in the creation of the commodity, the commodity form, then externalize themselves into all these negative things. So if you only look at the realm of distribution and you say, I'm just going to, you know, fix these issues, the, the contradictions are still in place. So then the agents, the antagonistic agents, the capitalist and the worker can react accordingly. Mostly, you know, the capitalist can say, oh, as I gave the example before, my worker is getting a thousand bucks a month, raises rent or whatever else. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that to connect it both with uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict to this, uh, this ther theoretical approach and to the new podcast that we will be releasing the second episode soon. Uh, Eddie had been uh, on a 14-hour shift of the day that we recorded the first time, but he, he will be on the second one. Uh, the, the chapter 10 podcast that deals with labor, the importance of seeing this theoretically is is also of practical importance. Um, when you look at the realm of production as the heart of capitalism, you realize that the workers in those realms producing those immediate uh, things upon which what happens after is that workers in other sectors either distribute it, exchange it, or serve it uh, for people to consume. What you notice is that the workers in that moment of production, production and Production is used as a, the whole and as, as, a, as a moment, but the workers in that sphere are at a pressure point in the system. And what we've seen from the modern left is an inability to penetrate these circles, both because they're ignorant about their status as a pressure point in capital, and because they look at these circles and they say, oh, they're primarily uh, white workers, which is not true, or they're bigots, they're, they're this and they're that. Um, so it's a, of practical importance to have this theoretical knowledge because it tells you that, well, if we want the best chance at achieving socialism in the U.S., we have to get this working class in line with our program, which means we have to organize them in their workplaces, we have to organize them in their union, and we need to have uh, uh, the situa a situation where the working class grabs power in the United States. That is the only way that the empire as it functions stops functioning as an empire and just turns into a regular nation. That's the only way the conflict uh, that ultimately leads to the Israeli-Palestine, uh, um, the, the, the occupation of Palestine by Israel, the only way those international geopolitical conflicts, um, you see, it's hard not to use the word conflict, but <laughs> <laughs> the only way the uh, uh, imperialism stops is by killing it again at the root. And the, ma the biggest magnet of capital right now is the US, uh, that's the empire uh, since, post-World War II political economy. So it is our ultimate duty as folks within uh, the metropole to do all we can to have a class whose interest is not in continuing wars and killing uh, people abroad. A class whose interest is just to have fruitful lives here um, to get that class in power. And to do that, we need to engage centrally with this working class that deals directly with production because that is what scares the shit out of capitalists um, because it is at the heart of their economy. One of the things that um, John Henry mentioned in the podcast is that um, a lot of the big bankers or most of the big bankers, uh, they have stock in rail 
um, and they have stock in these productive industries. And even though our economy has shifted towards service work and towards other kinds of uh, precarious work, that work that is done at the heart of that, that is done in, in production is still at the heart of it. So we still have a duty to organize those workers, um, regardless of what they think. We have to change their mentality and um, interconnected with the struggle against imperialism is the struggle to organize those workers in the realm of production um, and, and worker, the working mass overall as well. Yeah, I think uh, the pressure point way is a good way to phrase it. And I've never heard anyone use that except for our buddy, John Henry there, who, who works in productive industry. But, and this is a major oversimplification, but think about it this way. Like this is how he, you know, helps us uh, conceptualize it. You know, picture, and we want to organize everyone, right? We want to win everyone to our side. But picture um, all the Burger King workers are unionized. And one day they say, oh, um, we're going to organize against capitalism. We hate capitalism. And we're going to go on strike and try to bring the economy to its knees. Well, you know, I like Burger King, but I think I could live without it for a while, you know. <laughs> um, now picture, I don't know, the those workers in the oil industry decide to go on strike. And all of a sudden, oil, which powers 95% of the American economy, uh, is no longer flowing freely. The whole economy shuts down and it's going to be utter chaos to the point where they can demand control of the state. And this is what a lot of thinkers like James Connolly, um, fam or, uh, a famous Irish comrade who led the Easter Rising, would say, the power to control or the, the battle to control the state is just a reflection of the battle to control industry. Now, obviously, it's probably a little different when you look at how much our economy has shifted to tech and then also to the service sector. Like you kind of, I think it's necessary to have a, a little bit of a wide net or a broad appeal similar to what Bernie was doing. But that doesn't mean, especially as Marxists, neglect productive industry because that is where the most surplus value is being created, right? And that's where that's who holds the most power over the economy in the end. Yeah, well, the, I, I think a, a good way to put it is the, the early Marx um, in 43, I believe, he, when he discovers the role of the proletariat as a revolutionary agent in history, he's like um, German, he, he's talking in specific to German emancipation, but I think we can apply it to our context. But German emancipation, uh, has as its heart the proletariat and as its mind philosophy. We can switch philosophy, put uh, theory, a Marxist theory or whatever. But what that means is that you have a whole body that is moving towards um, towards emancipation. But just the heart of it is the proletariat and the mind is, is the theoretical part, right? Which means that all the other sectors are important and necessary for revolution, but that the one that should be at the heart of it because it's at the pressure point in capital is uh, uh, those workers that are uh, dealing directly with production. Um, and what we have now is a predominant, uh, that what's predominant in the left is, is not that. Uh, the heart of the movement is not the, the proletariat, the working class dealing with uh, production. But yeah, it's important to see all of these things as interconnected, uh, the situation of Palestinian expropriation, uh, the situation of quote unquote left politicians who support that and who support uh, uh, means of dealing with inequality within realms of distribution uh, or other realms. Um, it's important to see all of this as interconnected. Yeah, and I think credit to Andrew Yang, he has brought in some people who aren't normally involved in the political system. Like, um, I think it's like 40% of the country at least doesn't vote every year. So, and I've seen interviews specifically with people who say they work in productive industry who support Yang because they like the UBI, you know, maybe they've been scared out of socialism, but if the government says, we'll give you a thousand dollars, you know, they're like, oh yeah. And, and that's why it's, you know, that's sort of what I've been thinking with making an effort to talk about Andrew Yang and sort of his, his bad comments on this that like we said, we think come from a, um, a, a misunderstanding theoretically or a lack of theoretical knowledge is, you know, if you have been a Yang supporter, what's going to fix your problems and, and the horrible things that we see in the world today um, is not just giving you a thousand bucks a month. It's going to be changing the relations of production. So they're not completely irrational, right? So your life isn't completely run by a capitalist who doesn't care about you and sees you only as labor time. Um, yeah, you want you have anything else to add, Carlos, or, or should we call it a day? Um, let's see. Well, yeah, uh, like you mentioned uh, in that last comment that um, 
Yeah, I, I mean, of course, the thousand dollars in everyone's pocket would would feel nice. I know it would definitely help me. I mean, I have ten bucks left over once I pay rent, um, <laughs> so a thousand bucks would definitely be nice. But um, especially if administered correctly, if you put cap on 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 rent and and you make sure that that thousand bucks doesn't reflect into inflation and and stuff like that. But um, it is important to recognize that it's not just a directly economic problem that people need more money or whatever. It's a problem of autonomy and of not feeling like the eight to 10, 12 hours you spend at work, you're just a slave and, and, and a machine just there doing, you know, life d shouldn't start when you clock out of work. Um, and, and I think that's fundamentally the issue. And when you approach the question of a thousand bucks, yeah, it helps, but it not only continues the structure that requires that thousand bucks to be given, but it continues a structure where people just look forward to the weekend. Um, they don't want, they don't look forward to that nine to five job. Um, and and that's yeah, it continues. So it can it it perpetuates a culture where to tie it back to the beginning. To where you can have politicians say, oh, we, we have to fund this ethno state because it's good for the economy. And people just accept that and go, oh, right. You know, that makes sense. That's the kind of culture that's created by, as we're, we keep saying, the, the production at the core of our system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the socialist project is not just a project that makes sure that people have what they need. It's a project that fundamentally transforms people so that they can embrace a different form of freedom and not just embrace it but embrace it in a way that they can take advantage of it and, and live fruitful lives, meaningful lives with that freedom. Um, and just giving a thousand bucks to people a month, sure, it, it might make their purchases, uh, the things they can buy once they're done with work a little more comfortable, but um, it doesn't change the relationships at work. And, and our goal is to make those meaningful, autonomous relationships where as Mark said in the Gotha program, where work becomes life's prime want, where people want to work because they express themselves creatively. Um, so yeah, yeah, now I'm done. <laughs> yeah, that's the highest stage, right? For Marx, you know, Marx yeah, didn't really yeah, use the right. word socialism. He says, you have dictatorship of the proletariat, which brings you into communism. And then from then on, you're just reaching higher stages. And that higher stage is the diminishing in the gap between mental and physical labor, right? You're no longer at work forcing yourself to be there. You're there because you know you're valuable and, and your work in itself is fulfilling. And this is sort of like what Asitar, Dr. Asitar Bear says, a dream, it's you know an achievable dream because humans have lived communally. And if we theoretically, you know, workers own the means of production, then, then we can achieve that kind of society. But it's, you know, that's what we're building towards slowly you know probably long after our death you know a higher stage of communism and that's the ultimate goal right the ultimate goal isn't give everyone a big bank account the ultimate goal is to create a society that um allows everyone to flourish uh, so yeah uh should we plug anything before we head out here we got the journal coming up follow us on instagram twitter uh yeah uh like us on facebook and, and follow us on facebook we're not much on facebook but we're we're looking for for someone to to handle our facebook account maybe a little bit more consistently than than i have been but um yeah check out the website we're publishing on average two to three articles a day so um uh, check that out uh, we have a new series the angles anti during series that dr riggins was doing concluded um, and now we're doing a series, he's doing a series on Lenin's left-wing communism and infantile disorder, a book I think is absolutely fundamental uh, for any Marxist today to read, um, because it also helps in, in making the distinctions uh, that we've been talking about today. Um, and it does so in a historical context of the Russian Revolution, which is a revolution that I still think we have quite a bit to learn from, so. For sure. Yeah, and if like like we always say, if you want to write for us, email us. And if you have other skills and you would like to contribute them to our project, graphic design skills, or if you'd like to run our Facebook or whatever else, you think you'd be good at that. Social media person, let us know. We're always bringing new people on. So yeah, solidarity. Solidarity.